Good afternoon. My name is Chris Leak, and I'm the chair of the City County Planning Board. I'm now called to order our October 28, 2021 City County Planning Board virtual work session. Again, we are still working due to the state of emergency. All planning board members are participating remotely. Mr. Murphy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, George Bryan. Here. Melinda Donegan. Here. Walter Farabee. Here. Jason Grubbs. I haven't seen Jason. I don't so. see Mr. Grubbs yet. And we'll hold off for now. Uh, Clarence Lamb. Here. Chris Leak. Here. Mo McCray. Here. Brenda Smith. Here. Jack Stillman. Here. All right. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. I'm now going to turn the meeting over to you to go through our agenda for today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Board, we do have uh, three items on the agenda today, uh, one of which uh, the first one is uh, one that requires board action. The other two are information, oil, and discussion. Uh, the first item is uh, an item. It's a planning board review item for a special use permit for uh, case W3499. Uh, it's, it, it is a... Um, will be a city council special use, special use permit for reduction of side and rear setbacks for the use kennel indoor to certify that the proposed site plan meets UDO requirements. Uh, this item uh, was originally scheduled to come before you in October, but they missed a, uh, a, a deadline on getting a revised site plan back to us since this is just a planning board review item for the planning board. We brought this item here. Uh, so that they could stay on track to go to city council at their meeting in November um, because they have a contractual obligation um, in their purchase contract that they need to have that uh, resolved. So with that, I'll turn it over to Desmond Corley, uh, who will give a brief presentation. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I am doing this for the first time from home today, so bear with me if things don't look the same as they normally do. Are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I think Chris did a good job introducing this one. It's an elected body special use permit. So the board is going to be looking at the site plan for compliance. Um, the petitioners are requesting or they're proposing the use kennel indoor. And the use specific standards for kennel indoor require certain setbacks that this site and their proposed site plan will not meet. And therefore, the elected body, in this case, the city council, will have to approve a special use permit. As Chris said, the board's role is to um, certify that the site plan meets UDO requirements. The site is at the northwest corner of North Liberty Street and Linden Street. It's just west of US 52, across the street from BIMCO. Uh, if anybody's familiar with that building with the nice mural on it. Um, here is the proposed site plan. It's showing, if you can follow my cursor, one existing building to remain. There's a new building, or there are a couple of new buildings. This is the larger one in the central portion of the site. Um, and there is also like an activity slash bar area up here in the upper right corner. They're gonna close all existing curb cuts on North Liberty Street except for one. Access will be restricted there because the UDO won't allow it to be used. Um, they have multiple <laughs> open spaces for the dogs, activity areas for the dogs and the humans that will accompany them to this place, um, as well as for the bar in the upper right that I mentioned earlier. Uh, after some work, this site plan uh, came together and now meets all UDO requirements, so staff recommends that it be sent forward to the council. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Right. Uh, Mr. Brown, I, I think I see your, your lips moving, but you're on mute. There we go. Sorry. Mr. Corey, um, where is the issue with the setback? The setback can't be met on this side, I believe. And Elizabeth is on the call. She reviewed the plan. If I'm wrong about that, um, let me know. But I believe it's this corner where the setback can't right. be met. It's, it's both there and in the new building that they're building. Uh, if you'll notice yes. yeah, where it clips it right there. Oh, right there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It, yeah, okay. All right. Is, uh, would the board like to take action? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Clarence. I move that we recommend, or I move that we approve um, this. Uh, I don't this case. I don't have the number in front of me now. Yeah, I do. W three four nine nine. Thank you. W three four nine nine. The motion is there. A second. Second. Second by Mr. Stillman. Murphy, would you please call the roll? Uh, yes, sir. George Bryan. Yes. Melinda Dunnigan. Yes. Walter Faraby. Yes. I don't believe Jason has joined us, uh, but I'll call his name. Jason Grubbs, not here. Uh, Clarence Lamb. Yes. Chris Leak. Yes. Mo McRae. Yes. Brenda Smith. Yes. Jack Stillman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the board that item uh, will go forward to City Council with a rec unanimous recommendation on the site plan. And with that, we can move to uh, item number two on your agenda. And this is uh, Kelly Bennett on our staff, who is a liaison to the Public Art Commission. Uh, we'll be just uh, providing you with uh, an overview of the Public Art Master Plan that was uh, adopted earlier this year uh, by both the or by all uh, the Public Art Commission. Uh, the city council and the county commissioners and with that i'll turn it over to kelly thank you chris and thank you uh planning board members can everybody hear me okay yes yes yes, yes. okay Can you see the presentation? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we'll start off. Um, what is the public <coughs> art plan? This is was facilitated by the City County Public Art Commission. Uh, the plan was adopted by the city and the county earlier this year. And it sets the agenda for the next 10 years of city and county public art investments as five goals and then project recommendations, which include locations and ideas for public art. There's a strong case for public art, um, defines a sense of place, creates pride in the community, attracts visitors, increases foot traffic in downtowns, um, and increases the length of time and uh, money people will spend in a place. And an investment in public art uh, is also an investment in local jobs. Um, there's a study that I cited in the, in the report um, that shows how, you know, even when an artist is from out of town, you still have local people to help install, uh, for instance, the sculpture at the central library. So, so those jobs um, do have um, effects in the local in the local community, no, no matter what. Um, this is a quick look at um, some of our peer cities public art administration it shows their annual budget, um, the amount of staff that they use. Um, and then how many how many projects a year that they that they do with that with that staff and that budget, and also whether they have something called percent for art, uh, which is um, type of funding mechanism that um, uses capital expenditures. Uh, when when you have capital expenditures, it reserves typically one percent for public art to go along with those expenditures. So if you're spending, um, you know. $10 million on a public park, uh, you might reserve $100,000 for public art that could go into that park. Um, and that leads us to the goals of the plan. And the first goal is basically um, a percent for art ordinance. And then it states to include public art in future city and county investments, such as parks, libraries, recreation centers, greenways, and streets improvements. The second goal is to increase public art funding for projects at existing parks, greenways, libraries, municipal buildings, 
downtown Winston-Salem and neighborhoods. And this is different than, than that percent for our ordinance. This would be, uh, you know, our, our existing parks. So projects that, you know, when you're not uh, rehabilitating a, a big public park, but you want to put a sculpture in it, the, the budget would come out of come out of this this type of funding. Goal three um, is to help foster a local public art economy that develops local artists, fabricators, and other related businesses. And there are a number of actions in there to help help with that. Uh, goal four is to raise community awareness of the city county public art program. And goal five is to care for and manage our growing public art collection. Uh, public art projects for the next decade, uh, current staffing and pre coronavirus funding levels, the commission's likely to complete about 12 to 15 public art projects over the next 10 years. Um, that may be an, an under underestimation, um, but we don't don't want to overpromise in this. Um, but with recommended larger budget allocations and a per percent for art ordinances, that could easily increase uh, to twenty five to thirty projects. And you know those projects, you know, can look like a lot of a lot of different things. They could be downtown or parks and greenways. Um, you know, they could highlight significant people in in our community. Um, yeah, they could could really run run the gamut. So anything from artistic bus shelters uh, to large scale sculptures around our community. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Could I ask a question, uh, Mr. Lake? Sure. Yes, sir. Um, when you say the commission will will do these, what does that mean, Kelly? Well, the Public Art Commission facilitates these projects. Um, they have a, a small budget from from the city that's typically about fifty five to fifty five thousand dollars a year, um, and then sometimes that budget needs to be used for, um, you know, for instance artwork for the Benton Convention Center, which was recently expanded. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, they will do projects um, like the artistic bus shelters and we're, we're um, sending out a call for artists right now for a round of artistic bus shelters and we'll probably do 10 or 12 of those around the community. Um, and then um, the county oftentimes will fund a project. They have um, the Clemens Library um, has, has some money attached for public art. So we'll be, we'll be looking at that uh, over the next couple months as well. So are you saying that this, these are things that the commission pays for? Um, or, well, or is it, it just, the city and the county pay, pay for them. And okay. the commission, you know, acts as, a recommending body, you know, depending on on how how big the budget is, you know, if it's a smaller so, budget. So item. other projects will be going on, is what what you're saying. It, it we're not just these. Oh, definitely, yes. Yeah. It, is there any commitment from the county to put public art at the new courthouse? Um, the county typically will get through a project and kind of see see how much see make sure that they didn't go over on spending and then we'll commit to funding public art there uh, we've we've talked to uh, the deputy county manager about about public art there and we hope that they'll they'll have funding for it uh, but we won't know for sure until until they get farther along in that process yeah and and you know, I, I think I've mentioned this before when you've uh, presented, but about eight years ago, us taxpayers paid for uh, Marshall Park and some public art in there. Is there is there really a commitment from the center to do that, city to do that? I mean, we haven't seen anything. Um, the city is, from what I understand, moving forward with, with Marshall Park. I think there's a lot of complications um, just because there was 
a building that was supposed to be built on the east side of the park that kind right. of holds in the park. So a lot hinges on that. And it's just, it's been ages. So I just wonder how the, the wheels move with sometimes when you, I mean, it's good to have a plan, but we want to see it happen. <laughs> Related to Marshall Park, you know, the, the, there were issues, you know, with the contractual obligations of how that project was first envisioned, and they are, uh, the, the, the city manager's office, uh, they are in the process of trying to uh, kind of unravel some of uh, those ties, and then, and as Kelly mentioned, uh, we'll, we'll look to move forward on the project as, um, essentially as the contractor, you know, I mean, you know, doing the job and paying the contractor to do it as opposed to doing it as a pass through the way it was originally envisioned. So it will be moving forward. I can't give any kind of update as far as a timeline, but it's, it's, there will be public art in it and there will be a park. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I, I, I hear you. I understand. It's, I a, it's a star in the middle of our city. <laughs> I think right. everyone feels that way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Are there any other questions for? I have a question. Hey, All Kelly. Right. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so um, kind of piggybacking on what um, Mr. Brian was saying, I had a question. So does the commission only engage on or provide input and recommendation on projects at city uh, buildings or property that you're paying that the commission is paying for um they could um do something on on private property it takes you know it takes a little a little more uh a little more action uh one of our recent projects the winston and portrait project is is actually nine pieces of art around the city and some of those pieces two of them three of them ended up uh, one on the Winston Lake Y, one on the William White Y, and then um, one more on the Boys and Girls Club building. So um, that took a, a little more organizing um, and you know protections for both parties involved. It's a, it's a lot easier to put publicly you know city owned artwork on city owned property, but it can can be done to, to have it elsewhere. Okay, I was just wondering if someone was building a, say a sizable building, say a hotel or office building and wanted to contribute to public art, if they could utilize the commission as like a recommending body or to help um, identify the artist or something like that. We, you know, the, the commission could certainly help Point, point out um, different artists around the community. We're actually working with Grub Properties. They donated half the cost of a sculpture that's gonna go on the corner of 4th and Spruce Street. And um, so that will be in the public right of way and the city will own the artwork in the end, but, but Grub, you know, in, in helping pay for that has, has, you know, served on the selection committee and it's, help him move that, that project forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, thank you. And, and I'm sure there are ways that the commission could be uh, involved that you know perhaps uh, may not be specifically spelled out and or um, you know, currently even thought of currently. Um, you have, um, you know, you have instances like the the uh, river otter or the river otter project, which was actually money that uh, Lidl, uh, Lidl grocery store contributed as opposed that, that that was one of their design options is they chose public art, but instead of putting it on their property, they um, you know gave the the amount that that it would require to the city, and then the city worked to commission that piece of art. So I mean, I think there there are numerous ways uh, that. That could be done. You know, that was a UDO requirement, but if a private developer probably wanted to do a piece of public art uh, and wanted to have some input and it be near where their property is, but maybe not on their project, I mean, I think there are ways that that could be worked out through the commission. And one more, I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't, I saw on the, um, on the chart and you presented it, we don't currently have a percent for art. Is there 
been um, discussion of that that you know of? I guess. Yes, this is something that we will be bringing to to the city in, I believe, March of 2022 for them to to consider. Okay, good. I'll keep an eye out for that. I think it's important so we can get more projects. Definitely, definitely. I would just like to add that I that I that I'd like to thank Callie uh, for what's an absolutely wonderfully comprehensively prepared report uh, that I think serves as a great guide to uh, to staff and to all of us going forward. And I'm gonna I'm gonna play the part um, that everybody least likes hearing about and that is it is absolutely imperative that when these when these pieces are installed that the the commission the the planning department someone has got to have access to the money to maintain them and to keep them up uh or we're just going to create a really sad mess and look second class rather than first class. So anytime you hear uh, the need for repairs, cleaning, maintenance, please support that going forward. Yeah, and you know, we do have, we, you know, it might not be earmarked for for maintenance, but there there is a there's a good good bit of funding in the public art budget that can be used if need be for any any damages to projects. And work is very and wear and tear. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great comments and questions. All right, there's nothing else. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that presentation. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Kelly. No board um, action required on this one. That's correct. That was just an informational item. Uh, and as is number three, uh, number three is UDOCC 15, which is the text amount, uh, text amount modifying the accessory dwelling unit provisions in the uh, current UDO clear code. And we'll hear from Amy Crum on that. Uh, keep in mind that this is currently scheduled uh, to come before you as a public hearing item at your, and this says November 11th meeting, but we'll talk about that later. It's, it's actually your November 10th meeting. Um, because the 11th is Veterans Day, so we'll be meeting on the 10th. But again, we'll get to that in a few minutes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amy. All right. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Planning Board. Um, I'm bringing uh, for you, again, the... Um, basically the ADU text amendment. Um, we spoke about this last month. And so this month we'll go in a little bit more, not so many detail, but just finalizing um, the ordinance amendments. Again, the petitioner is a planning and development services staff and we are seeking to amend chapters five, six, and 11 relating to the definitions um, of dwelling unit and uh, dwelling accessory and the parking standards and provisions for dwelling unit accessory attached and detached. Um, accessory dwelling units, um, as you're aware, are small secondary dwelling units on the same lot as the principal structure with similar amenities as a standalone house. Um, they have been allowed in the Winston-Salem Zoning Ordinance since as early as 1930, um, but they were always subject to occupancy requirements, um, basically limiting those um, uh, uh, to be occupied by either relatives, adopted persons, dependents, servants, or individuals over age 55 or handicapped. And at that time, um, they were administered by um, either staff with an attached ADU being requiring staff approval or th through the Board of Adjustment. Um, in September 2017, uh, City Council adopted a new version or a version of the ordinance that retained the existing ADU regulations, um, but removed that occupancy requirement. And this was based off of case law coming out of Wilmington at the time and changed the approval process to the special use district rezoning. And prior to this adoption from about uh, 2015, 2016, there was extensive public output, output um, outreach done and comments received in various iterations of the ordinance um, that we went through until um, we got to where we are 
uh, now. Um, since September 2017, uh, one ADU has been approved. Um, and there's one ADU that's currently in the approval process that actually just came before you at your last meeting. In fall 2020, uh, City Council asked staff to research the best management practices for ADUs and then staff presented their findings in April 2021. Based off these findings, City Council asked staff to review and propose amendments to the current provisions um, that will better um, meet affordable housing goals within the city. Um, and as such, this amendment was placed on the 2021-22 work program. After review um, of our provisions and comparing them with our peer communities, we realized that um, our current provisions are not in line with our peers. Um, and so the proposed amendment would simplify the ordinance and also bring us in line with our peer communities. Um, the amendment maintains the distinction between attached and detached um, ADUs. Um, and then the changes to the specific ADU provisions impact the city only. Changes affecting the county relate to definitions and um, one cleanup amendment to the section 5.3.1, which is actually accessory structures. So our basically definition in the section 5.1.3 amendments, you can call these cleanup amendments, they're fairly simple. The definitions um, are reverting back to the original definition for dwelling unit um, due to an error that was in UDO clear code um, at the time. Um, when UDO clear code was adopted, the consultant had pulled the definition from the environmental regulations, not the standard zoning regulations. So we're just going back to that standard zoning regulation definition for dwelling unit. Um, and then we are removing the word occupancy from the definitions of accessory unit, dwelling unit, um, basically because it's no longer relevant. So it's, it's sort of just to clean that up and clarify that the occupancy is not something that we look at. And then for section 5.3.1, we are adding a simple phrase in the beginning of the statement about uh, principal use, basically stating, unless otherwise stated within this, this uh, chapter, the um, principal use to, is determined by the Director of Planning and Development Services. Um, and we're basically changing Director of Inspections to Director of Planning and Development Services because Director of Inspections is a position that no longer exists. Um, so just a simple cleanup cleanup um, amendments for that. Uh, and these are again, are the only changes that will affect the county. So going through the amendments that will affect the city, um, the first one is the approval process. We are changing from a special use rezoning to a permanent with conditions process. This will remove the elected body review, the $1,000 um, minimum fee and the two month approval process. Essentially, if a petitioner wanting an ADU meets all the conditions as specified in this ordinance, zoning staff can approve the ADU. We are adding um, a principal use statement for both attached and detached. Currently, um, there is no statement. It basically, in the definitions, it'll say residential building, but it doesn't really specify what type of resident, residential building. So we're, we're specifying that. For attached, it's single family residential building. And then for detached, it's a single family residential building and manufactured home class A. And we are making no change to the number. Um, right now, currently, you can have one ADU, um, whether attached or detached per lot, that will remain the same. Uh, parking, we are removing the one off street parking space that's currently required. Um, so no additional parking would be required for either attached or detached ADU. Um, and then setbacks, there's again, no change to the, the attached ADU provisions. For detached, for new detached, um, it would be five feet from side or rear. For conversions of say a, a um, detached garage, you would have to be in compliance with the NCB building code for setbacks. And then no ADU shall be placed in front of the front facade of the principal structure. For size, um, no change to the attached um, provisions, which basically is 50% of the heated floor area of the principal with a maximum of 1,000 square feet. Um, detached would be 70% of the total floor area of the principal with 1,000 square foot maximum. And then no matter the square foot of the principal, um, you're allowed 576 square feet, which is essentially a two car um, detached garage, basically a 24 by 24 building. Um, height, um, currently there is no height provisions um, and we are adding um, height provisions for attached. We're adding a provision that states the ADU cannot exceed the height of the principal. 
Um, for detached currently, it's the height limits of accessory structures, which is 17 feet. We're amending that to 25 feet maximum. Uh, other changes, we are removing the structural requirements section for attached ADUs. This is um, the section that requires, looks at um, placement of doors, stairs, utilities. Um, when we don't get into utilities, that's the discretion of either Utilities Commission or Duke Power um, or Piedmont Natural Gas or whomever it may be. And then also these get into design elements, which is a really fine line we can do with single family development. And there are also the language in there, there's language that says where feasible, who determines where feasible is so that just it's just cleaner just to take that section completely out for the attached. For detached, we are adding a permanence provision, um, which will basically require that the ADU is um, on a permanent foundation and prohibiting the use of RVs and trailers. So a uh, property owner couldn't use you know, a pop-up camper or doing maybe a tiny home, which tiny homes are typically built on flatbed trailers. Um, they wouldn't be allowed to do that, to that either. Um, and we are removing the use of manufactured home class A and class B as being able to be used as ADUs simply um, from a size perspective. They don't make um, class A manufactured homes or class B manufactured homes small enough, small enough to meet our size limitations. I think the smallest one is 1200 square feet. So it's really a, a moot point to include that. Um, this is information I shared with um, y'all back in September last month, um, and it's just put into one, uh, one document here, one table. And we're looking at our peer communities that we looked at. We looked at Asheville, Charlotte, Durham, Greensboro, Raleigh, and Wilmington. Um, and as you can see, you can sort of go through line by line. All of them administer their ADUs by permitted, permitted with conditions approval process. Um, so you can look through that. All of them allow for single family detached. Durham and uh, Raleigh go a little bit step further. Um, most of them all limit to one per lot. Um, parking is a little different. Um, only Asheville and Greensboro have one parking space um, uh, requirement. Um, Wilmington, just to remind you all that they used to have two parking spaces required, um, but with their new um, a land development code that they approved in August, they went to no parking uh, provision, parking requirement. And then um, sort of the size and setbacks, again, setback size usually ranges at the maximum between about 800 to 1,000 square feet. And then setbacks can be any from five to 15 or based off of their accessory structure requirements. And then heights, a little bit different, but usually if they specify a height, um, it's usually around 25, 26. 26 square feet, and which is essentially about a one and a half story uh, building. To summarize, uh, the Legacy 2030 Comprehensive Plan highlighted ADUs as a way to promote creative housing options to accommodate the growing population and promote infill development, age-friendly communities, and gentle density. The Winston-Salem Forsyth County Housing Study and Needs Assessment, as well as the Winston-Salem Affordable Housing Coalition both identified revisiting the ADU ordinance to aid in addressing housing need, particularly regarding affordable housing. Again, only one ADU has been permitted under the current ordinance provisions, and one is currently in the process. Um, staff believes the proposed provisions would bring the UDO in line with our peer communities, and staff presented this ordinance um, amendment to the Affordable Housing Coalition. The members were supportive of the changes and are currently drafting a written endorsement. And again, we recommend approval and I will answer any questions y'all should have. Um, yes, Ms. Crum. Um, one of my major questions here is why um, you're proposing different standards um, now than you had um, back five years ago when you were also proposing an ADU ordinance with zoning staff approval. I'm not talking about the one that got adopted. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the one that staff was proposing before the city council decided to go to the special use zoning. Um, in that original proposal by staff, um, there were differences. And what I'm trying to understand is why, why you're veering away from those that original proposal now because 
again, you're proposing the same type of approval process as you did before. And in particular, one of those was the um, setbacks. I'm trying to understand why you're proposing the setbacks you're proposing now. Um, back in 2017, the setbacks you were proposing were um, half the principal um, resident setbacks, which in a 9,000 square foot lot would be, I think, 12 and a half feet and a seven foot side setback. And now you're proposing five feet rear and side. Um, I do remember seeing materials that the staff generated that showed lots and it, and it showed configurations of ADUs on those lots. And the staff was arguing at the time that the 12 and a half foot and seven foot side setbacks would provide more compatibility with, with neighboring properties. So can you, can you tell me why you're going to this five feet front and rear, because I don't think the 12 and a half feet is out of line with our peer communities, given the chart that you showed us. Yeah, the 12 and a half feet um, rear setback and seven foot side setbacks, that was actually for non-residential districts. Um, and when you look at what's currently allowed, um, the only difference really is the 75 feet from front line, from front line. Everything else is, you know, right now it's for interior lot is five foot from side or rear. And then for corner lot, it's three feet from side, a rear lot. So it, you know, we don't feel like we're straying too far from what we currently have now that still allows for use of the yard without, you know, having, um, you know, different, you know, or extreme setbacks that would limit that. Well, you know, and then, I, I don't believe that 12 and a half feet was for non-residential districts. I believe it was for residential districts. It was 50% of the required rear setback is what the, in residential was 50% of the required rear setback for the district and the minimum side setbacks for the district remain the same. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as, you know, what has, you know, what has changed, you know, since then is again, in our looking at the regulations and trying to, um, provide things that are more in line with how we uh, view and review um, just regular accessory structures and how close they can be. We felt like the five and five was more in keeping, you know, again, we're allowing a little more height than what a, an accessory structure can be. But, you know, if you're an accessory structure of 17 feet in height or less, you can be as close as three feet to the rear and three feet to the side, as long as you're 75 feet back from the front property line. Uh, so going to five and five was an increase in height, but still keeping a one and a half story building, we didn't feel like was out of line with, um, with things that are already currently allowed. Just because someone is in the structure doesn't mean it's um, any different than any other accessory structure. And I will, I will mention too, that you know, since 2017, there's been new ordinances. You know, new peer communities have changed their ordinances and they've adopted and amended. So we have you know, uh, new provisions to sort of look at and see how others have done it. Namely, Raleigh would be one of them. Wilmington would be another. Um, I know Charleston has recently done one as well in the last couple of years since that 2017. So when you look at peer communities, that's sort of what we're looking at and gauging at to see what's out there as well as, you know, there's just frankly more information about best management practices regarding ADUs. Amy, yeah, if I, I could just, I'm just uh, about, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to kind of add in a little bit of context uh, to that as well as the staff member who generated those images and did a lot of that research and uh, that ordinance back in uh, 2017. And I think to echo what Chris and Amy said, Melinda, I think it's several different things. That's what they mentioned about the state of the art has changed a little bit in terms of what our peer communities have done. But I think another aspect that's different is Winston-Salem has really developed an affordability issue in the housing market in the last five years. And during that time, the city established the Affordable Housing Coalition. And their key work item one of their things that they recommended out of that was 
improving or changing our affordable or not affordable, our accessory dwelling unit regulations to make it more uh, usable for folks. So that was one of the, the lenses that we were kind of explicitly told to approach this through from city council, who basically is the one who gave us the marching orders to put this back on the agenda. So it, again, it's if we were taking the same approach we did five years ago, you could certainly make a case for some of those other setbacks and provisions. But when we looked at it this time, as Amy said in the presentation, we're really trying to remove some of those barriers to affordability and make ADUs more practicable in more situations while still retaining kind of those minimal uh, kind of protections to make sure that they're compatible. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I understand that the, the territory has changed a little bit since 2017. Um, I just am concerned that we haven't really thought through um, these standards in a way that makes, makes sense um, for compatibility purposes. And um, I just think we should take a little more time and look at it um, the way we did last time with those visualizations and with more public engagement, which I know I I know you've talked to the Affordable Housing Coalition, but I think there are other groups that would like to be briefed, would like to have um, question and answers, um, some kind of a public process where they can engage with, with staff on this. Um, because it is, it's gonna be a big change and I appreciate the reasons behind it, and, but I just think that we should do it in a way that tries to avoid problems down the road. All right, are there any other? Yeah, comments? could I ask a question? Um, what are we doing about conditions of short-term rental? The, um, basically, the um, city has no restrictions on what residential properties can be used for short-term rentals, and that's for, or duration of uh, rental contracts. So the, the fact is that we really don't, as a whole city across the board, look at that. So I know, um, but that, uh, that, if you look at the research across cities, that definitely affects affordability when people put second places on there and then rent them out uh, as Airbnbs or BRBOs, it drives up prices rather than drives down prices. George, your, your inquiry is actually one that the Affordable Housing Coalition raised as well a couple of weeks ago when we presented to them. And mm -hmm. what we mentioned to them is Kelly Bennett uh, on our staff actually researched Airbnbs and BRBOs, I think back in 2019, it might've been 2018, but he did a fairly exhaustive report on how our peer cities regulate those and kind of how many of those are on the market in Winston-Salem and if there was a need for any regulation here. As part of that, he also talked to Jerry Contos, the deputy city attorney. And again, as Amy alluded to, Jerry's interpretation is that ADU regulation, we just don't treat those any differently than, uh, you know, kind of any other type of rental situation that's for, uh, you know, a, a property for six months or a year or anything like that. And the justification was there wasn't a, uh, a basically a, a demonstrable problem in the community with those to add that extra cost the extra staff time, somebody's got to review those applications. And if they're found to be deficient, someone's got to go out and issue notices of violation and enforcement. So the official recommendation of the planning board at the time was to keep monitoring the situation. And if short-term rentals become a problem, do something about it at that point. But to our knowledge, we haven't seen any real issues arise in the last two years. That's not to say that it couldn't happen in the future and it, it may be an issue worth revisiting down the road, but at least from a staff recommendation, we didn't see that as something that needed addressing as part of this ordinance. Well, I, I, I guess my 
experience in my own neighborhood and serving on the board here, we've, we've noticed it is an issue with over 20 short-term rentals just in our neighborhood. It has affected the ability to, uh, to have rentals at other uh, pricing. Um, so we're, we're already seeing it in Winston-Salem, whether you've done another research on that or not. Um, it, it does seem counterproductive, and I, I'm certainly familiar with Asheville's model on this, where they build into the, uh, to the, rental, the short-term rental registration a fee, which then pays for the, the kind of administration that you're talking about in, in relationship to that. The other thing I'd mentioned that I guess it may be connected to what Melinda's saying is I, I brought up this issue at my uh, civic club this week and sort of briefed them about where this was going. And uh, it was a lot of surprise that this would be done by right. Um, that, that what people had bought into a single family residence um, would now not be single family residential zoning. Um, it would be the possibility of two families living in an area that was expected to be single family residential. So there was a lot of surprise in this. And I, I think a lot more work needs to be done in terms of talking to the community about this and getting their engagement in this and, uh, and support behind it. affordable housing expert, our need for housing and affordability in the city far exceeds any number of amounts of ADU we could put on every single single family residential. And the, the, so I think too, you have some contradiction there, right? So if we're worried about affordability, then people shouldn't be worried about their single family residential status versus non-single family residential. That's the, the key there. So it's just kind of contradictory, like your two points of contention. So I think, you know, we ADUs are always going to be issues of community engagement. However, I do think this is a really good effort to align us to pure cities and align us into like the forward movement of where Winston-Salem is going. And we have like to have it by right and not allow it to be something that we can do with our single family home lot as my parents age, or as you know, hopefully I can convince my four year old to live with me forever. Maybe she won't like to, maybe I won't be cool enough, but that's an option, right? So I think we have to kind of be very careful that community engagement is always a priority, but we have to align our times and our codes to the growing nature of our city. So we don't wanna be behind. So I'm saying like we can do community engagement, but I think you're going to find the community that you're talking to probably didn't want this years ago and probably still doesn't want it now. Sometimes we have to act the best benefit of those who can't voice their opinion at those meetings. Well, I, I think there's also a, a lot of debate, particularly looking at Portland on whether ADUs are truly affordable. In fact, I don't agree with calling it affordable housing. I, I agree with causing it more infill because uh, what we find is that the, the ADUs are priced at market rate in that community uh, and, and there are different market rates for that. So uh, I don't think that Portland has necessarily seen that that has been an affordable. It is simply more housing. Well, and again, and that, that ties back to the larger issue of the overall housing picture. I mean, you're right. Uh, you know, ADUs in and of themselves are not going to address the affordability issue. But again, whenever you have additional tools in your toolbox to provide additional types of housing, you're essentially freeing up uh, other units in the community that will then, you know, perhaps be at a more affordable level. I mean, you know, the, one of the issues with affordable housing, especially as, as we have it here, is the, to, you know, is the um, lack of options. And this just provides another tool in the toolbox. But, you know, whenever you're looking at the cost of construction and you're looking at allowing something, you know, theoretically between the 700 
and a thousand square feet. I and mean, if you're looking, if you're looking to come new construction, you're looking at spending between 70 and hundred K. So it's not like you're going to be necessarily inundated with these things. It's going to take, it's, it, you know, it's going to be, you know, the folks who either have the capital um, and have the need um, for, you know, their family member to live with them or something along that lines, or they have something that's easily convertible. Um, you know, they have a, they have a, uh, a detached garage, but again, this is not a magic bullet for affordability, and there really no such thing exists. It's really just supply and demand, and this will help a little bit on the supply side. Um, I agree. I, you know, I, I I think the comments are are good, and I think we could go back and forth. You know, we we've had the same discussion before. We had the same discussion when I was on the zoning board of adjustments, and viewpoints very seldom change. So the arguments remain the same. If you were on one side five years ago, you're probably on the same side. So to keep going back to the public, we've heard the public before in the past. Staff has made a valid effort to try to get us in line with our peer cities. At some point, we have to look at that and move forward. Things don't stay the same. This isn't Mayberry. And I, and I, I hate to say that, but this, this isn't Mayberry. This is Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We're, we're, we're trying to move forward. And there is a lack of housing here in our community. And this is an, an effort to try to curtail that. Is it perfect? No. But to keep rehashing it and saying the same thing that was said five years ago, I, I, I think it's kind of, at, at, at some point, we have to move on. So if there are additional comments that have not been stated, you know, I would love to hear those. But if we're going to continue to say the same thing that we said five, ten years ago, we're going to have a public hearing on it. I would just like to conclude by saying the mere fact that we've seen one ADU developed in the city of this size since 2017 should tell you more than just a little bit. Um, it's time for change and change for improvement, and I say let's get on with it. Give it a shot. And I agree. One thing that really promotes it, in my view, is you've got the opportunity to use the existing utilities and infrastructure um, on land that's already set aside without increasing those costs. It's not like building a new development where you have to put in new streets and new land development. So to me, it's a very positive aspect. Whether it's affordable or not, it gives you that option. Yeah, I just want to add, as past staff who actually worked on this initially, and I probably talked to several of you about this at that time, uh, I really think this is a good version of it, and the changes that have been made are important for the city that we live in now, and we want to live in moving forward. We've only seen one. Uh, there is opportunity for more with better ordinance. Um, the last thing I did want to mention is just I don't think it's fair to uh, find fault in the ordinance when you uh, automatically assume that it's going to lead to a short term short term rental or a two family household on a lot. ADUs can also be, as we've seen, someone that just has a family member that they're providing a, sec a home for on their property outside the main house. So ADUs have many uses. It does not mean that you have weekend rentals coming to tear it up at an Airbnb. It could be a grandma. It could be uh, Miss McCray's daughter when she moves back home. There's a, a, a lot of different ways that ADU can be used. And so we have to consider all the uses and the way that we want our community to grow. Affordability is a serious issue. It won't fix it but it will be another tool in our toolbox. And I hope and pray that we move forward on this finally. I had to leave the organization for this thing to come back around. So <laughs> clearly it's not about me, but I'm excited for this ordinance and uh, the changes that have been made. Uh, one more comment at the risk of being repetitive. Um, I just have to say that I am very concerned that we haven't had an appropriate public engagement process for this proposal. Um, I don't think we can prejudge what the, what the conversation will be. We need to have a conversation. 
Thank you. We're not doing our jobs. All right. Thank you. Are there any other comments regarding this? There's no board action required on this issue. All right. Thank you so very much. All right. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Item, item four on the agenda is debriefing the public hearing meeting of October 14th. Um, anything for discussion? Chris, I, you were going to get back to me on that, uh, of what happened to town and country discussion. Yeah, and I have that, um, and I can send it to you via email, but I can also just go over it point by point if that's kind of what you, I mean, it's just a chronological order of kind of what happened. Um, the This is dealing with the River Rock subdivision there off of, um, um, what's the name of the road? <laughs> Ready Ransom. Uh, Ransom. Ransom. Ransom, thank you. Gosh, I'm horrible with names sometimes. Off of Ransom Road, uh, the developer petition did complete the application uh, and it, uh, the item met the uh, requirements for the September meeting, uh, but there was neighbors uh, reached out to Councilor McIntosh uh, who organized a community meeting with the developer and petitioner and staff. And uh, at uh, as a result of that meeting, the developer requested a continuance prior to the deadline for the automatic continuance. And of course, according to the planning board bylaws, this is automatically continued. We, it doesn't actually go on the agenda. And, you know, I believe the assumption was that it would be, it would go on to the October, your, your, this happened in September, it would go into the October uh, meeting. Uh, the request was removed from the agenda because the continuance was automatic. Um, and the website was updated to reflect a continuance to the October meeting. But then after another community meeting with Councilman McIntosh and staff, the developer and petitioner decided just to move forward with their development as proposed. Um, as, as part of that discussion, again, we, you know, Aaron asked um, that you know, we actually convened a meeting with DOT staff to see if uh, the developer would be willing to um, put forth money towards a study of the Ransom Road and Polo Road interchange, or excuse me, intersection to try to alleviate potential concerns uh, there, improve the situation. It's already a level of service uh, that's probably C and uh, you know, right on the borderline of, of, of C and D. And um, they were willing to put that money forward as part of that, since this is a work session, or excuse me, since this is a not a public hearing item. It is a planning board review where the public doesn't have the right to speak. It was as part of that agreement, it was agreed that we would put it on to the, your work session, and I can't remember the date, uh, in September for you to consider since it wasn't for public input. And, you know, the, the folks who were originally, who, you know, the neighbors who were opposed to it were, you know, because of the regular zoning meeting is a public hearing that you can sign into they were under the impression they would be able to sign into the meeting not necessarily to talk but at least to hear what was going on but since the work session we only allow folks in that actually have items on the agenda that they can speak on we didn't let them into the meeting we steered them to the youtube feed so they could watch your discussion on the item and th that's essentially what happened it wasn't anything that we were trying to you know subvert their right i mean technically they don't have any right to speak because it is a planning board review item but it wasn't anything intentional to try to keep them from being able to participate there's really no public participation it was just kind of the how the sequence of events happened that ended up on work session versus um, going to your regular meeting. One of the things that we actually alluded to and talked a, a little bit last month, or excuse me, at your October meeting, the, the, the zoning here, whenever you ask the question is revisiting how we do those continuances. You know, then it used, there was a time when we did the continuances that even though it was going to be automatic, we would put it on the agenda. We would mention it to you as part of our consent agenda. Hey, this has been automatically continued so that, you know, again, it's continued date certain and we're discussing it in the meeting. And I think that's what we're going to do going forward. So it's just clear whether it be a public hearing item or, you know, a zoning recommendation from the planning board, whether it be a subdivision or other type of planning board review item that the planning board would have, even if it's going to be continued to the next month and it's automatically continued, we're still going to bring that to you at your zoning hearing so that 
you know when it's continued to anyone who was interested knows when it was continued to again it doesn't necessarily it's not going to give anyone the right to speak but it will be more transparent and um not give folks the impression that something was done behind a curtain whenever that wasn't the case well i think we're still under the ethical uh rule to have public meetings so we need to be clear and transparent with the public about when those meetings are going to occur on items that they're concerned about so i appreciate you uh giving me that chronology right and again and they did know about the meeting it's just i think they were upset that they couldn't be actually in the zoom again even though they couldn't speak i think that was part of the the, the neighbors knew i can't say that everyone knew but i know there was a there was a fairly large contingent that were making comments during the youtube session um you can find yeah you, know, you can kind of see their log of comments um so there were a number of folks on there but again it was nothing intentional it wasn't it wasn't meant to curb um, or try to do something behind closed doors. It simply was just kind of the sequence of how it happened. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. If you want me to send that to you in writing, I can. But. No, as long as you're, as long as you're conversing with the neighborhood, that's good for me. All right, thank you. Uh, I don't want to step on your chair, uh, on your toes, Mr. Chair. Were there other items for the, for the debrief for the October uh, 14th meeting? I don't see anyone else saying anything, so no, sir. So we can go to the staff report. All right, and actually, I had the I had that as one of my items under staff report. So I actually only have two items, and I've already I've already mentioned one of them today, and I've mentioned the other one on the last, the previous two meetings. But um, the your 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 public hearing your zoning meeting in Oct in November is on November tenth, which is on a Wednesday. Uh, Veterans Day is the 11th and the city offices are closed on that day. All of our advertisements, even though on your agenda it says the 11th, uh, all of your, all the materials that have, you know, been in the paper and have gone out in letters, et cetera, references the November 10th planning board meeting. So we'll have that meeting on the 10th, which will be a Wednesday. So again, just make note of that. Those, those time change, just a different day. And uh, the other item I have is again just a reminder that this is your last work session for uh, 2021. We won't have a work session in either November or December. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I have no other news to report. All right. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Ms. Smith, I see your lips moving. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You'll mute it. Okay, try again. A motion to adjourn. I see it's raining outside my window, so we both say. Is there a second? Can try. Second. <laughs> all right, second. You all have a great evening. Be careful. Thank, Thank you. Stay dry. Bye.